Let us remain standing just a moment now with our heads down for a word of prayer. Blessed Lord, we are grateful to thee to know that how thou dost guide the eagle through the pathless air. You guide us some through the waters and some through the floods, some through deep trials, but all through the blood. How you lead your children, nothing can stand in the way of the great and mighty church of the living God. It shall prevail. Though all hell is against it, it will prevail, because going ahead of it is a great and mighty conqueror, the Lord Jesus. We would ask you to bless us tonight, Father. We stand as humble children waiting to hear from thee. Speak to each heart tonight in a great and mighty way. Close our hearts to any unbelief. Open the gates of faith, Lord, and ride right in on the winds of the Holy Spirit. Heal the sick and the afflicted that's in our midst. Bless those, Lord, who are weary along the road. We would ask you, Lord, also to save the lost. That one who fell by the wayside. We pray that you'll bless the pastor of this church, our dear and beloved brother Hutchinson. May you guide him in all spiritual truth. May he walk side by side with his forest and love until thou art through with him in this journey. Bless the pastors, the deacons, and all that's associated with this great fellowship. When we leave tonight, may we say like those from Emmaus, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us along the road? For we ask that in Jesus' name, amen. amen. May be seated. <coughs> I am more than happy, I'm just simply elated tonight, to have the privilege of being back in this uh, great church again. Memories linger on from the last meeting we had here. And the boys and I, just a while ago, crossing the bridge, it was just one year ago tonight when we left here closing the meeting. One year ago tonight. And how the Lord times things just right, though we might not understand it, but he, he makes things just right. And we have been privileged to visit the, the outskirts of the city, Newark, and uh, so uh, I hope the folks in Newark will be bad about that, but I say your little sister city over next to you here. And the Lord has blessed us exceedingly abundantly this week, and I come up here on my vacation. I started on my vacation in the early fall, and the whole group broke down with the Asian flu. We had to come back. Then I started on the vacation down the Salmon River, the River of No Return, where the Christian businessman takes me each year when in the States. And the second day down, there was a plane come over, dropping little messages that a brother had just passed away, and I come out. And I had the meeting in California at Lake Ford at the, out at the fairgrounds, and when I got home, I thought, maybe I'll get just a little rest. They called me Brother Bosworth was dying. So I rushed down to Florida to see him and come back. Wife said, now you can have this time at home, these days here before I begin in Louisville or Kentucky. So, Brother Hudson called me a telegram. I turned everybody down that day, but I just hardly couldn't turn this little brother down to come up here and Brother Joseph. So I'm tired and we're very much worn, and we just come out of a great healing service just a 
met her a little while ago, forced and tired. And I said to Brother Hutchman, I said, should I tonight just uh, uh, preach and go ahead? I said, I got to drive all night tonight in order to meet another appointment tomorrow right after a dinner at Louisville, Kentucky, driving through the turnpikes and so forth tonight. And he said, uh, I believe that people would be a little disappointed if he didn't pray for them. I said, well, I'm, well I'll just speak to them a little while. And pray, and then I sent my boy and told him to give some cards if there was many here to be prayed for, so we could get the people and in the line, lined up. So we will try to do that. And now, instead of preaching to you with for you tonight, I, which I'm not very much of a preacher to begin with, but I would just like to give you a, a little testimony or something to talk on the word just for a few moments. And that's based the most of the time on praying for the sick. Now, over in the book of St. Mark, the 11th chapter, I wish to read the 20th verse. And just for a little way of getting a little context, or a little text for what I want to use as a context after a bit. I love to read the Word. Don't you love it? Oh, there's nothing like it. The precious Word of our blessed Savior. You know the Scripture is so perfect that they can never fail. Now, the 11th chapter of St. Mark and the 20th verse, just one little verse. And in the morning, as we passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the root. May the Lord add his blessings to that little text. The Word of God is so infallible that not one jot or tittle can ever fail. And just on that much scripture, we could base an eternity knowing that it would never Faith. And because it is the part of God, God is in His Word. And we're notice that how this, it always happens, no matter how strange it may seem, but in God's own good time, He makes every word testify. Jesus said when he was here on earth, the scriptures cannot be broken. And he said, you destroy this body and I'll raise it up in three days. Because it was based upon the scripture. For David the prophet had said, I will not suffer my holy one to see corruption. Neither will I leave his soul in hell. He knew that scripture pertained to him, for the scripture was to the Messiah, the Holy One. And he knew his position and his standing in the kingdom, that he was that person. So knowing that the scriptures cannot be broken, Therefore, he knew that within 72 hours, his body would have to raise again, or the scriptures could not be broken. Many people wonder, he said, the three days and nights, if you'll take it, he said, within three days and nights. He died on Friday afternoon, was up on Sunday morning, because not one cell of that precious body could corrupt. Because the Word of God said it would not corrupt. And he knew before corruption set in that he was raised from the earth. That putting confidence in what the Word said. You say, if I knew there was a scripture that pertains to me like that, I believe I could have the same faith. Well, my beloved friend, every divine promise in the Bible belongs to you. And it's just as essential to you as it was to him. 
You find one promise here that God has made, and all the heavens and earth would pass away before that promise would ever fail to act in your spirit. Because it's to the believer, whosoever will may come and be partakers of these blessings. Now I think that one of the main things that causes us to miss the blessings, and remember, faith cometh by hearing, hearing of the Word of God. And the reason that we miss it is because we don't feed on it enough. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Man shall have his daily bread by the word of God. But we try to make it more or less some far off promise way away in some other age. But the Bible says, now we are the sons of God. Not we will be, we are now. And God has not made it complicated. And many people try to think it that way, that it's complicated. Therefore, they miss the real blessings of the Word. But trying to make it some hard thing. And my purpose in these next 10 or 15 minutes is to reveal to you the best that I can by His blessed Word that God is not complicated in any way. The believer makes it complicated. God makes it simple. Now in our text tonight, Jesus had just come from Jerusalem, where he had seen, no doubt, tens of thousands of people along the journey that was sick and needy, and many great things should be done, as the people would think, but he could do nothing, he said, until the Father showed him first what to do. St. John 5, 19. Not one miracle did our blessed Lord perform until God showed him first what to do. It wasn't given to him just to take the blessings of God and throw them out any way he wished to. For the scriptures cannot be broken. And he said it, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, that the Son can do nothing in Himself but what He sees the Father doing. That's true then, because the Scriptures cannot be broken, and it's the Word of God from His lips. And then would you ever think that all this great power that was within Him, for He was truly Jehovah God made manifest in flesh. He was no prophet. He was the creator, the prophet God. As people today try to take this divinity from him and make him just a mere teacher or prophet, oh, they are so wrong. Man giving the lowest name that they could give him a Spiritless fortune teller, Beelzebub. And they sent him to the lowest city. They even the smallest men of the city had to look down to see. That's what man done to him. But in giving the lowest name. But God exalted him so high that even he has to look down to see heaven. And give him a name above every name that is in heaven and earth. His name is Jesus. All things, powers, and everything is subject to it. That every tongue shall confess it and every knee shall bow. 
in honor of that name that's God given your obedient son. How glorious is that is that name. And the thanks of the Jehovah God who could shed forth his great glory as we look towards the heaven and the stars and the solar system is more than dust in his hands. And you'd be so concerned that even when Jesus of Nazareth passed by that simple fig tree and looked upon it as if to find something to eat, and he said, No man eateth from me. In the original Greek it says, For a season, which the word forever only means for a season. It forever is a space of time because it's forever and conjunction forever. But eternity has no beginning or end. So he said, No man eateth from thee for a season. Now you notice immediately something happened to that tree, though it didn't show that it happened. And on the next day, as they passed, Peter looked at the tree, and he said, Behold, this big tree which thou did curse yesterday is drying up. Something had taken place. And he looked to them and said, Verily I say unto thee, If thou shalt say to this mountain, be moved and cast into the sea. And don't doubt in your heart. Now in the original it says this. In the lexicon, Greek lexicon it says, If you shall say to this mountain, be ye lifted up and thrown into the sea. And don't doubt in your heart, but believe that it is being done. You shall have what you say. We are looking for a thing so spontaneous. But what did he mean? You look at the mountain and say, Be thou lifted up and thrown into the sea. And then in your heart believe that what you have said is taking place. Maybe just one little grain of sand begin to move to the whole mountain. You might not be able to notice it, but there's something in your heart says it's being done. You shall have what you say. That's the faith. Many of us are prayed for at night. The next morning, say, well, there's no difference. I don't feel any difference. There's where we are failing. That doesn't have to show one thing. But if thou believest in thy heart that what you say is being done, you shall have what you say. That's it. If you believe that what you say is already taking place, I don't have to feel it or see it. I believe it. That's the reason that it takes place. If someone, if I was standing miles away from the city, hungry, and a loaf of bread would save my life, and I asked you for a loaf of bread, and you gave me 25 cents, the purchase power of the loaf of bread. Now, I could be just as happy with that 25 cents as I would be if I was standing right by the counter ready to buy the bread, for I've got the purchase power. Now, the Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now, too many people in our meetings 
And this is for your good. Too many people in the meeting are looking for some tangible evidence. That isn't faith. That's right. That isn't faith. Faith believes it even though it's contrary. It believes it. Moses endured as seeing him who was invisible. God gave Father Abraham a promise of a child by Sarah, his wife. When he was 75 years old and she was 65, and Abraham endured 25 years resting on that promise. For he counted that he who made the promise was able to keep the promise, and he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong, giving glory to God. And we are supposed to be the children of Abraham. God didn't give him the child for 25 years, but he endured as seeing him who made the promise, and know that his words could not fail. With my purchase power. There's where it is, Christian friends. Please understand. May God open our hearts to this understanding. That faith is not a myth. Neither is it something that uh, you just imagine. Faith is positive. Faith is a substance. Just the same as this glass is. Just the same as this book is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence. Oh, blessed be His holy name. It is the evidence of things you do not see. But you believe it. When God has spoken it, God has to keep His word. And every promise is yours if you can receive it as yours. Now, if I had the cord in my hand, I'm maybe five miles from a loaf of bread. But I can rejoice just as much with the cord in my hand as I could with the loaf of bread in my hand. For I had the evidence that I've got the bread when I got the purchase power of the bread. When I got the faith. For my healing, I'm as good as God, no matter what takes place or what the doctor says. That's what you believe. Now, I can take the water and start rejoicing. What are you rejoicing for? You're not eating bread, but i got the purchase power. The doctor says you can't live but about two more weeks, but you're rejoicing. What you rejoicing for? I have the evidence in my heart that God's promise is anchored here. All devils out of torment can never shake me from it. I'm bound to receive it. I hope I'm not yelling at you. Uh, but you see, when I got the quarter, away I go quickly to the store to get the bread. All along the road, I can rejoice and maybe get weaker all the time. And maybe before I arrive at the store, I may get so hungry I got cramps all in my stomach. That doesn't make any difference. I get hungry and weaker all the time, but I'm holding the purchase power of that bread. <laughs> and if thou canst believe, and say in your heart and believe that it's taking place right now it went to work. You can have what you say. Then just say, Lord, I believe you and I am healed. Without a shadow of doubt, something is anchored in there. It's beginning to take place because you said it. 
What have you said? You've used the Word of God and it's eternal. It cannot fail because it's God's Word. And God's Word will create the promise that it holds. Someone said not long ago when I was speaking at a meeting, said, do you mean to believe or to say that you believe that this world will be destroyed? I said, yes. said, how do you figure that? How could it be destroyed? I said, by the word of God. With the atomic destroyed, I said, it'll be destroyed by the word. For the word created it, and the same word that created it said it'll be destroyed. God said so. How it will happen, I don't know, but it will happen. The word that created it. The same one said it will be ended. And everything that has a beginning has an end. It's those things that does not have a beginning has an end. God has no beginning, so therefore He has no end. And the life, His own life, eternal life, the Greek word Zoe, that God's own life has come down into you and you become part of God. And you have eternal life which has no beginning or no end. Got to go up with that eternal life. You can never perish because it's eternal. God's promises are eternal. Believe and you shall receive. But could you imagine quickly now that the great power that was in the Son of God, and when he met the devil, he never used it. He just took the Father's word to show how simple it was. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. Just to show the power of that word. He also said, destroy this body, it will be raised up again in three days. What was it? He was eating that word that made the promise. There's no way for the grave to hold him. God's word. And could you imagine if you could only see the simplicity of God's eternal purpose and of the sovereignty of His grace? Could you imagine Him using that great power to put a curse on a tree because it didn't have any fruit on it and leaving thousands lay unhealed? The tree is part of God's creation, as same as man is part of God's creation. But to show that he is concerned about trees, about insects, if he's concerned about those, how much more is he concerned about you? Just some time ago, about four months, I guess, Brother Wood that lives next door to me. He was the Jehovah Witness forbidden to go to the church. He had a boy that had a paralyzed leg from a, from a polio. And at Louisville, Kentucky, where we go next, there was a, a meeting out there at the high school gymnasium. And there was great things the Lord did. His wife is Methodist. Oh, no, I believe that. Anderson Church of God, called the First Church of God. And you probably get the program of her shady green pastor. It's the National Wide Broadcast, Brother Neeper, the pastor. Then, Brother Woods did not believe in no such stuff. But when come to the meeting, he seen something take place, his heart was strangely worn. I went overseas, come back, and one night, at Cleveland, Ohio, he was setting a city block from the Holy Spirit turned and said, You 
Your name is Woods, and you're from a certain city in Kentucky. You're Jehovah's Witness by faith. And you've got a boy there that has a paralyzed leg brought up on him, and your wife suffers with a horrible tumor. Thus saith the Lord, they're healed. They didn't know what to do. They turned and looked at each other and went on with the meeting. Of course, I followed on. In a few moments, she put her hands down to her side and said, Thanks, that's her husband. Look here, there's no knot left. But David, get on your feet. And the little boy jumped up both legs just as normal as they could be. They lived next door to me. His father being a reader in the Jehovah Witness. Now, if there's any Jehovah Witness, you no reflection. But he's excommunicated his son from their fellowship. And then said he's gone off and gone mad. Then a few years, about two years passed. Mr. Woods lived next door to me, a wonderful neighbor. One day I was out cutting some grass in the backyard for a little while, and then a car drove in the other woods, and he called me to come down. He said, meet my brother Lyle. Oh, I had a very cold handshake. The howdy. And just like that, walked on, great, big, strong man. And I, I said, how do you do, Mr. Woods? I'm certainly happy to meet you. I am certainly a great friend of your brother here. And he said, yes. Yeah. Sit down. And real died in the world Jehovah with me. So just a little bit, he began, Banks began to tell him about the things that seen this meeting, and he just turned his back to it. Just then, by the grace of the Lord, to a lost sinner, unbeliever, said Mr. Woods, your wife is a black-headed woman, and you're running around with a red-headed woman. You have two little boys. He said, I guess Banks told you that. Turn his back back to me. But I said, last night, when you was with her in the house, and there was a man beaten at the window, and you sent her there. It's a good thing you didn't go. He would have shot your brains out. He said, oh, God, be merciful to me. And tell him the story and gave his life to the Lord Jesus. Simplicity. Hundreds of sick children waiting for the vision. Down on the river, we went fishing with his old daddy. Come down to the Lord his father. And his father said, if anything like that I could see it happen, I believe it. On the road, he said, would you go fishing with me? I said, if I can get a chance to get my calls all up this afternoon, I will go in the morning. On the road down, it had been raining. I said, every, being a vision, I said, every stream that week, cross will be muddy. But when we come to it, the wisdom dock is going to be beautiful and blue. I said, we're going to fish, and we're not going to catch anything until the evening. I'm going to catch about 25 fish weighing 8 or 10 pounds. You're going to catch one, and Mr. Woods, your son's going to catch one. In the morning, I'm going to catch a scale fish, large for its size. And by that, you know that God lives in rain. He looked over and winked at his son and went on. Every word of it happened just exactly the way God said it would take place. What is it? The simplicity that God works in. Two weeks later, Mr. Lyle and Mr. Banks and I were back again. Some of my relatives owned the dock. We'd feast all night with our lines and we'd caught several big fish. And the next morning we had nothing. That day we paid a ride, we stayed away on the counter, just, just a little mental rest. I was catching sunfishes to put on the line. And all of a sudden, while sitting on the side of the boat, with the little fly line, pulling up the little sunfish for bait, 
the Spirit of the Lord came down. And I said, The Spirit of the Lord, it shall come to pass that there you will see the glory of God, for there is a little animal somewhere that will be raised from the dead. And when I come to, I wonder what I have said. Mr. Wood, ladies, my now say, repeat that, Brother Ben. I said, what did it say? He said, about the little animal. Well, I had in my mind, a stuff was going to take place at home. I have a mixed audience, but I want you to understand this. We're a little skeptic of kids. I guess they're all right, but I, I just don't care too much for cats. None of the brands. So we uh, all we never had one around the house. So my little girl and little neighbor girl come up and she said, Oh daddy, someone has poisoned the poor cat and said it's got it out here, won't you let us keep it? So we got it in a box and I looked I seen the condition, so I said, all right, just put it in the shed. And of course, the next one, we had a bunch of kittens. And my little boy, Joseph, kind of a, kind of a rough little fella, he picked one of the little kittens up and squeezed it so hard, so he squeezed the breast from the little fella. And he threw him down and didn't know what to do with him. And I thought, you know, maybe the Lord's going to raise that little kitten. It's probably died, and he's going to raise it up. Well, Brother Banks said, that would be wonderful. And the other Brother Wood said, the Lyle had just been converted, and I just baptized him, and he had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so, we let it go, and all that night, caught no fish. The next morning, we pulled into a little cove, and we are going to try to catch some large sunfish to go home. While I was sitting there, casting a line, couldn't get a bite, and Mr. Lylewood pulled real hard and he let his line lay too long and a little sunfish about that long, little green looking fella, you call him your Graham, I believe. Oh, he swallowed that big hook all the way down in his little belly. And so Mr. Woods looked up and said, look at that. All the way down. And he just got a hold of the line wrapped around and pulled. And when he did the Little belly come out, the stomach, part of the gills come out, they pull the hook out, we looked at him and put him over the water and he flushed two or three times and turned his little fins out, turned over sideways. He said, little fella, you shot your rod. And the winds of blowing floated the little fella back into the fish. We set the fish for some, oh, I guess to say, half hour. And I was, I said, it's strange. We better move to another location because the fish are not biting here. And Brother Banks would say, let me just try once more. He threw, threw his line over behind some pads. And I was sitting there looking at that little fish laying back in the trash there on the water, been dead for some half hour, this little belly out of his mouth and the gills is done turn white. And I was fishing there, now this may seem fiction, but truth is more stranger than fiction. And as I looked at the little fella, just then coming down the holler in those mountains, I heard like a wind. And it comes sweeping down, and all of a sudden it covered the over. And I just been talking on the scripture with them. And just then something said to me, call to that little fish. And before I knew, Brother Banks said, what's the matter, Brother Banks? Right? And I said, little fishy, your creator, Jesus Christ, makes you alive. And as I'm standing in this sacred pulpit, over oh, the Holy Bible, as my witness God is, that little fish spoke to me, said, swam to the water just as hard as he could go, perfectly well. Mr. Lyle was fixed over the boat. He said, Brother Graham, that's a rebuke to me, because I said to the little fellow, you 
shot for the rod. I believe that he's going to take my life for that. I said, brother, brother, we just show him how simple he can serve you. He's concerned with that everything, but this is the truth. He's the God of the harvest. He's the God of all eternity. It's his word. I would have no more spoken that face than nothing if something had to stop first. What was it? He spoke for a second nearly by the Holy Spirit who threw his lips to come the green power of all the might of God because God said so. And that taking place that way, how much more will it be through the written word of the Lord Oh, Lord. 
Lord, grant to your people a special blessing tonight of your divine presence. We not know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow. So we pray, God, that tonight, by your grace, that has projected to us a Savior by your love, may it send him again tonight in the form of the Holy Spirit. And you have said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Get into these branches of the tree, Lord. Energize everyone that you're connected with and show signs and wonders of your resurrection that it might increase the faith of the people that they might look and live. For we ask it in Jesus' name, thy beloved Son. Amen. Now, my beloved friends, our time slips so easy, and now tonight there comes a time again where this must be found wrong or right. The times that I've helped the Mohammed Bible, there are three times us in number. Help the Mohammed Bible in one hand, the Koran, and help the Bible of the Lord God in this hand. So one's right and one is wrong. Challenge it. Never has Jehovah failed. He can't fail. Now, you sick and needy here. God has already purchased your healing. You are already healed, every one of you. He is something that was a finished product of Calvary. Those were every redemptive blessing that Christ died for was completed at Calvary. The price was paid. The devil is only blessing you. Jesus lived. We don't have to take some theologian's ideas to say he died 1900 years ago and that's the last we see of him. If he said that would be the last we see of him, we can believe it that way. But he did not say that. He said, a little while in the world you see me no more, yet you shall see me, for I will be with you even in you to the end of the world. The works that I do shall you also. I'm the vine, and you are the branches. The branches bear the fruit, not the vine no more. But the branch can't bear fruit until it's energized by the vine. Now, if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, if he is risen from the dead, sent back the Holy Spirit to be the comforter, to do the works, the Holy Spirit is Christ. That was a pillar of fire that was in the wilderness with the children of Israel. That was him that stood on the banks of Galilee and said, Before Abraham was I am. That was the pillar of fire that was in the burning bush. And he said, I come from that light, from God. I go back to that light, God. And when Paul met him after his resurrection on his road to Damascus, there he was, a light that struck Paul down. Nobody else saw it. Paul saw it. Those soldiers looking to see what they could see. They couldn't see nothing. But it was so strong to Paul so it cut out his eyes. You see what I mean? God can hide himself from one review to the other. It's God, not him that willeth or him that runneth. It's God that shows mercy. You see what I mean? Now, he has returned back to that light again. That this picture that you see, that this scientist has been bethel over for 10 years. He's here. If it's a spirit, you know it is. What, what would the spirit of John Dillinger bear? Guns, murder. What would the spirit of an artist bear? The touch of the brush. What would the spirit of saintly 
there. When the Lord is born, the same before Abraham and Lincoln, he didn't even know the notes on the book. That would be the, the spirit of anything would produce the fruit that that spirit would produce what it was. And the spirit of Christ will act like Christ, will do the things as Christ. And how we make a poor example of what his grace was to us. Now, if we go to the meeting, if you would just be reverent a little bit, I'm not as much of a preacher. I can't class myself. I say all the time as a preacher, because I don't have the education these ministers does and so forth. My gift is seeing vision. The Bible said there's five offices in the church that is ordained of God and put in the church. Office holders. First is apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors. They are God's foreordination by predestination, by foreknowledge, He saw placed them in the church for every age. In the local church, there's nine spiritual gifts that operate in the entire body, speaking with tongues, interpretation of tongues, and, and all the different works of the Lord, the gift of prophecy. Now, there's a difference between a prophet and a gift of prophecy. If the cross could be on one and the other, then it has to be judged before three judges before the church can receive it. But not the prophet of the Old Testament. He was born the prophet. He always was the prophet. He had the word about it after he was dead. He's still a prophet. Did that bother you? When the witch of Endor called up the spirit of Samuel, he stood in his prophet robes and he was still a prophet. He told him what would happen the next day. And certainly, death doesn't change a man, it just changes his dwelling place. If you're a sinner when you die, you're an unbeliever, or you might be a loyal church member. But if you die in your unbelief, there's nothing left for you but to be condemned. If you die in faith, that's what saves you. Your faith has saved you. You've got to go to eternal life because the eternal life is your faith in God. The same thing. May the Lord grant tonight that He will bless us now in these next few moments of the remaining part of the meeting. Cain. He said He'd give out a prayer card to Cain for the meeting tonight. Why are these cards given out? The sort you can keep lined up. That's all. How many people here sick and wish to be prayed for? Raise your hand. All of them here, the Lord. There you are. About 200 people, 300. How many cards have you got? 50. Well, who's going to be first now? I'll be 300. There you are. I said, let this woman come and this woman come. That's respect the person. They bring those cards down and mix them all up together before you. But if I want to give you a card, you're a card nobody knows where. You might get number one, and you next to your team might get 50, and next to get three. See? And then where are you going to call from? One, three? You don't know, I don't know, nobody knows. I don't know right now. I'm just standing here to call from somewhere. Where the Lord lays on my heart, I don't know yet. And then when you do come up, there's no sign you're going to be moving. It only gets the Holy Spirit moving in the audience. And when the Holy Spirit begins to move, then he goes right on out with those who does not have prayer card. See? Now, Jesus Christ, when he was here on earth, that there might be a stranger in our midst. When Jesus was here on earth, he said, I do nothing till the Father shows me first what to do. Look when Philip found the family. Jesus told him, what he told Peter what his name was when he walked up. So your name is Simon. And you're the son of Jonas. What well, astonished him said, But from here after you'll be called Peter, which is little stone. And up comes Philip. Went over and got Nathaniel and 30 miles around the mountain and brought him back. When he found him, he was under a tree. He said, Come see who we found. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. He said, Now could there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? He said, Come see. That's the best answer anyone can give. Come see. Examine it by the word. Now remember, 
There's going to be millions of Americans meet their doom in a minute. What would hinder tonight from this whole nation to be destroyed within five minutes? What did science say the other night? This nation of nationwide broadcast on that. We're five years behind Russia. They've got a Sputnik and put a man in it, dozens of them. Send them up there in the sky and move out right over this United States and say, Surrender. Or go to powder in a few minutes. Of course we would surrender. Save the life. What would happen? Russian soldiers pouring in by the millions, running through the streets and grabbing the women, ravishing young girls, sweethearts, all over the world to make a different ground. Sure, they're communist, cold hearted. What would happen? Go right into a nice home, kick you out of it, they use it themselves. It's Russia's land, and we're a satellite. Let me tell you, the church won't see that. She's going to be gone with that. Right. That's thus saith the Lord, it seems. It'll be gone by that time. Jesus is coming, and that's why these signs. That's, I said to, to my brother the other day, I can't understand. Now, this is a little personal. I don't believe I've ever made it public, but I'm going to say it now. I've never said it before in public in my life. See? To make it just, I'll make it plain if you understand. The other day I was wondering, what's going to happen on Carolyn, I know these things. That picture alone ought to shut the whole world. But not even a newspaper packed it. Why? Look at these great things that took place. The simplicity of God, good as he was a miracle. Why did it happen? How did it come to pass? Why can't people see that? I go to a meeting to my American people. And I speak to them, take the theologians, take them back in their office and lay the Bible down, take it out there and say, here, look through it. See if that is exactly what he promised. Then the Lord Jesus come around and confirm that. And people say, yep, pretty good. That's about it. They have eyes and can't see. Ears and can't hear. Now I'm sure, my dear friend, as much as I love you, Billy said a few months ago, come to Daddy, they're taking up a love offering for you. Didn't have to do that, brother. I didn't. Of course, I'm a poor man. But you know what feeds my children? Your money. What buys me a suit? Your money. Why would I ever come here? Why would I preach to empty seats if it wasn't you? Then if somebody loves me that well, shouldn't I be dead earnest with that person? I'm going to answer to Christ for it. I should be dead earnest. Listen, why can't these things be seen? Then here's what comes to me. When George J. Mason, the head of the FBI, give me that picture. He said, Mr. Branham, someday that picture will be sold on a ten cent store shelf, but not while you were living. That always stuck with me. Why? I said, why, sir? He said, the testament is not enforced until the testator is dead. He was starting human worship. Turn around and walk away. That stuck with me. And here a few months ago I was studying. Then here's what come to me. Listen. God's justice, God by foreknowledge knows who will and who will not. You know that. You're taught. You're with these fine teachers. Listen, you hear that? He said he heard. So therefore, in this day, he said, no man can come to me except my father draws him first. God has to be the drawing man of love gift to Christ by God. I wonder, when the great Elijah was on earth, people didn't recognize him when he was tall. Elisha took his place. They blessed at him, called him bald-headed because his young man was bald-headed. They didn't know who he was, but he was translated and gone to heaven or taken up. They didn't know who John the Baptist was until they beheaded him. The disciples didn't even know him. The disciples said, why does the scribe say that John was, uh, uh, Elijah must come first? Jesus said, he's already coming. He didn't know it. You see how it went right through? But God's justice, he called those who he knew. All he has foreknew, he has called those who he has called is justified. Those who he has justified, he has glorified. See? What he foreknew, listen closely, so you get faith to believe. They didn't know who Jesus was until he was dead, buried, and rose again. 
Let's take the Bible. Now, you and my Catholic friends, my background is Catholic. We talk about St. Patrick, the Catholic saint. He's about as much Catholic as I am tonight. But there's no other church they call him. But what happened when he had power to drive the snakes to my island and the legends and so forth we have of it? Then after he was dead, the church recognized him and canonized him as saint after he was gone. Look at St. Francis of Assisi, a walking preacher with the Bible under his arm. He was preaching and a bunch of birds chattered and said, Sisters, hold your peace while I preach the gospel. Despised and rejected the Catholic Church. But after he was gone, they recognized him as a saint and then canonized him. Look at Joan of Arc, you school children here. Joan of Arc, a spiritual woman who saw visions and had spiritual life. And what did the Catholic Church say about her? She was a witch. And they burned her to a stake. About 200 years later, they realized the woman was a saint. So they done repentance. They dug up that priest's body and threw him in the river. That's a big repentance. But they recognized her after she was gone. Now can you make two times two equal four? You're looking for something I may never be in this pulpit again. You're looking for something that's passing by you and you don't recognize it. After a while, when it's gone, then they'll pick us up and say, well, how did this happen? When did this revival go? When did this take place? It's too far, then. Heavenly Father, open our eyes tonight that we might see thy glory. Give us grace just now while we wait on thee. In Jesus' name, amen. Prayer cards came. Let's do what would we call from the second year. Was it 50? Yeah, 50, I believe that's right. 50, we, what's that? 1 to 20. All right. We took the first part of it this afternoon. Let's take the last part tonight. Let's start from K85 then. Eighty-five, nine, nine, five, that'd be enough. Who asked K-85? Raise up your hand. The colored lady boy back here. Come here, lady. Right here at the platform. Eighty-five, eighty-six. Now, little lady right here. All right? Right here. Eighty-seven. This is the lineup. Eighty-seven. Does anyone have you, lady? Eighty-seven. Eighty-eight. Who has prayer card? Eighty-eight. Prayer card. Everyone just keep real quiet. Watch this away. Pray. I mean, you realize how many Christians is here raise your hand? Do you realize what a challenge this is? Would you want to come and take the place? You're welcome. I'll be very happy to sit on the line here and watch, pray with you. Certainly. What am I representing? What am I standing here for? Do I have to do it? No. I'll do it because God told me to do it. And I stand here as a divine gift, not me, but him, to represent him. Then at the judgment, I have to stand with you. That's going to be the difference there. Now, and at the judgment, I have to answer. You have to answer. I have to answer whether I preach it. You have to answer whether you receive it or not. Now, if I hang you here, how many in your rules of Scripture says that Jesus now, right now, is our high priest? that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Do you believe that? The Bible said so. Then how would we touch him? Like the woman touched his garment? Yes, sir. She touched with the feeling of her infirmities. And she touched his garment. He turned around and said, Who touched me? He didn't know. And didn't know who touched him. And he said, Who touched me? Why, Peter said, All of them touched me. He said, But I got weak. Virtue, strength went from me. See? Now think of one vision. That one woman touched him, and the Son of God got weak. How about me, a sinner? Saved by his grace. What would one do to me? See? But why does it happen then so many times? Look at this, this afternoon, and here we start again. Why does it? Because Jesus said, These things that I do shall you also, and more in this shall you do. For I go to the Father. It's his word. Yeah. Now, if they heal somebody, I can't. Of course not. Now, you just be real reverent. Don't move around. 
keep your seat, sit real quiet, pray. Touch him, and if you touch him with your faith, faith, then watch and see if he don't turn right back around and touch you and talk to you and speak to you with an audible voice. He may have to use somebody else's voice, because the only voice he has is mine and yours. Only hands he has, mine and yours. We are the we are the vine, the branches. Now, everyone reverend, that's just while we pray. Heavenly Father, I bring to thee tonight myself with this audience. I bring them in behalf of their sickness. No old merciful God. Be kind to everyone. And may their hearts be open tonight. May they understand, anoint their eyes with eyesight. And anoint mine too, Lord, that we might see the invisible God working among his people as he promised. He promised he would not leave us, Lord God Jehovah. He promised he would be with us. And the work that he would do, we would do like manner work until he comes. Now, Father God, I have did all that I know how to do, the next is yours. Now we commit ourselves to thee and ask that you'll visit us tonight and bring joy to our hearts, healing to our bodies. For we ask it in Jesus' name. The next is for God. As far as I know, the lady that stands by me now is a stranger to me. I do not know the lady, and as I made a mention this afternoon, I guess we're strangers to each other. We are. This woman is a colored woman. I'm a white man. If this is a, a picture again of the woman at the well, a Jew and a Samaritan, Jesus let her know that there was no racial lines in God. No matter the color of your skin, that has nothing to do with God. We're everyone from the same tree. Exactly. Yellow, brown, black, or white. The country we was raised in has nothing to colored our skins one way or the other has nothing to do with God. By one blood, God made all man. If I was dying, this woman could give me a blood transfusion. But don't never put an animal blood in you, you'll die. Her blood's the same as mine. God created us both. And here we stand this afternoon, both strangers, never seen each other. Her colored woman, me a white man, a very a beautiful picture of the very St. John 4. How many knows that that's true? Scripturally, you've read where this woman went. Now, Jesus began to talk to her, and he said, till he caught what was wrong, he said, bring me a drink, and she didn't understand that. She said, well, you Jews don't have nothing to do with us Samaritans. We have a segregation. So why would you, he said, but if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. The conversation went at length about word of worship. After a while, Jesus found where her trouble was. He said, go get your husband. Come here. She said, I don't have any husband. He said, that's right. you got five. And the one you have now is not your husband. Watch what she said. Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. But we know, we Samaritans know, that when the Messiah comes, him when Jesus told him where he was before he came to the prayer meeting? He recognized him to be the Son of God. Is that right? The Messiah. How many knows that? St. John, the first chapter. That's what the Jews thought. What did the great teachers and scholars say? He's the devil. That's a fortune teller. See? What did Jesus say? You say that about me, I'll forgive you. But when the Holy Ghost has come and does the same thing, speak one word against it, it'll never be forgiven you. In this world, neither in the world to come, because they call the Spirit of God an unclean spirit. That's the, how many ever know that that was the blaspheme of the Holy Ghost? The call of the very works of God, the devil. That's what Jesus said. That's the blaspheme. 
unpardonable, never can be forgiven for doing it. 